And then also, um, please leave yourselves on mute. Um, in the end of the uh, meeting, you can unmute yourselves and ask any questions you'd like. Um, so my name is Sarah. I am the president of the Pre-PA Transfer Association at UCLA. And thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Asal, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Hello everyone, I'm Asal. I'm the director of resources. Um, so basically I find shadowing opportunities, volunteering opportunities, all of that stuff. Um, we have a link tree, it's on our Instagram bio, but I'll just add it um, in the chat. So it's nice meeting you all. Hi everyone, I'm Kayla. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you're good, Kayla. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm treasurer of the club. Uh, my major is gender studies. If you guys um, check out, please check out our Instagram. We have a bunch of events that we keep you guys posted on. And we also have giveaways that you can check out on there. Um, and if you guys have any questions during this meeting, please leave them in the chat for us to check out. So hi everyone, my name is Min. I am the director of events. I'm a fourth year human bio and society major minoring in global health. We have some really great events already planned for next quarter. So make sure you connect with us on Instagram to keep up with those. And to our amazing PLNU faculty members here today, Dana, Professor Loria and Amy. Was Amy, is Amy in already? I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We're really looking forward to learning from you along with what you have to share and what you're looking for um, in an applicant. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on our first segment titled mission slash values. Um, if you can all introduce yourselves and tell us about the PA program's mission, core goals and values and what your vision for embarking on the progress, the process of building a new PA program in San Diego at PL and U entails. Sure. Good. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Sarah Stanhope. I am the department chair, director of the program, and um, I think the name of your organization is is unique. I've never heard it called a transfer organization. That's very, um, very clever, very creative of you to, to think of it as a process as opposed to some big monumental change. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the mission of the program because I think um, it's uh, the culture of what we're trying to do is a little different. Um, PLNU as is obvious from the name of the university is a Christian university. Um, the Nazarene faith in particular has a strong um, ethic, if you will, towards service, and that is manifest in our program. So our mission is obviously to create extraordinary PAs, but to equally inculcate them um, a, a commitment to service to diverse, underrepresented, underserved populations. And we do that by having a very um, specific um, and dedicated components of our curriculum where students will in the first semester, in the first, sorry, the first phase, in the didactic um, phase, be spending a month in service to some population in, in San Diego. We have about 40 service partners involved with us right now um, where students will be uh, placed for that service. And then in their following year, during the clinical year, which I know you've all read enormous bits about, um, we have two electives, one of which um, is medical, but is also very specifically directed at service. Um, and I say that um, because it is such a huge component of who we are and what we're doing. Um, obviously, we have an equal and um, uh, equally compelling, I guess, um, uh, desire to, um, to graduate the most 
um, extraordinary PAs that California has ever seen. And so one of the questions I saw on your list was, where have we developed clinical rotations um, and clinical partnerships? So if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna skip down to that before I hand it over to Professor Loria who runs our didactic phase. Um, we have managed within our faculty to recruit two long-term San Diegan PAs. So they've been in the community for years as, um, as uh, clinicians. And through their extraordinary talents, we've managed to make um, really amazing connections to um, a wide variety of neighborhood health, family health center um, systems, in addition to hospital systems, Scripps, UCSD, Sharp. Um, and so I think we are blessed with having fingers into, or maybe hands, maybe it's more than fingers, into the, um, to the healthcare community within San Diego County. Um, and that's gone a long way towards facilitating really interesting conversations about how we can include not just the um, medicine into the training for our PAs, but all the social um, aspects that we as providers deal with now, in addition to just um, handing them a, uh, you know, telling them you need to take this antibiotic and moving on. So those are the things that I'm really excited about for us. And there are other questions I see that you have specifically you can, uh, we can answer, but let me hand it over to Professor Loria who runs our classroom-based um, and lab-based educational components. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I, I did also look at your, your questions and um, came up with a couple of answers and, and some information for you. Um, I really like that you asked, what does bringing diversity into PLNU's uh, physician assistant program mean to you? That's, that's a great question. Um, I think it's really important because we, we work with such diverse populations here in San Diego. And um, you know, there's so many, there's so many different locations, there's so many different languages, there's so many opportunities um, to work with diverse populations. And, and also like Dr. Um, Stanhope said, um, we really want to, to bring that into the program as well to, to, to teach students that you're not just treating the disease or giving a medication, you're treating the whole patient and you really have to understand um, that patient. So I think that's a, that's a great, um, that's, that's a great skill to have. And that's something that we definitely implement in our program. Um, what excites us? Well, uh, we get this question a lot. And I, I would say for me personally, it's having students. Just working with students is what's very exciting to me, but also working in and with the community. Um, so like Dr. Stanhope said, we're, we're going to have service months and one non-clinical and, and one of course clinical. and um, I think we're all very excited about having students work in the community, collaborating with partners. Um, unfortunately, um, Professor Miller, Laurel Miller, wasn't able to be here today. And she's really our service and outreach person, and she's made so many connections throughout San Diego uh, County um, to give students opportunities to work with some, some really great organizations. Um, let's see. Oh, the, there is one here that you asked about our anatomy facility. And we uh, will have um, anatomy labs using cadavers. And so that's, that's exciting. Um, that will be on our main, our main campus. And um, oh, Dr. Stanhope, they did ask about, uh, will our program be located on the main campus? Uh, Professor Luria, we're it, actually, yes. we're gonna, we can go ahead and ask you those questions um, later. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. We just needed to, you to introduce yourselves, but that's totally fine. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. I got ahead. I got too excited. Yes, I am Danielle Loria. I'm the director of didactic education at Point Loma. So, nice to meet you. sorry to be long-winded. I got excited to answer your questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, Min, do you want to go ahead and start us off with the next segment? Yeah, so our next segment is just some common questions that our attendees have and what we have as well. Um, I know that PLNU anticipates a 
matriculating its first class in August uh, of 2021 with mm -hmm. a class size of about 30 students. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's um, correct. Are applications rolling admissions or well, when will you accept um, applications up until? Um, right now, we're for this first year, we're accepting applications up until December 31st. Um, but next year, when y'all would be applying, we'll use the standard um, sort of CASPA window of April to October, early April to late October. Okay. And um, a location-based question, will your PA program be on the main campus? No. <laughs> no, that's why we don't have any pictures of the beach on our, on our website. Um, uh, uh, if any of you've been to the Point Loma campus, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, but unfortunately for us, but appropriately for San Diego, they have limited the number of students who can be there at any given time. And so right now that campus is pretty much limited to undergraduate students and the graduate programs are on um, regional campuses of their own. Um, we are very lucky. As a matter of fact, after I get off this call, I'm meeting again with the architects. Um, Point Loma um, bought, Nazareth PLNU, I should say not Point Loma, um, bought um, a building that had been a, a college of nursing in Kearney Mesa, if you know San Diego, um, and are in the, we are in the process of updating it and renovating it so that um, all of the things that we love that, that I think make Point Loma um, beautiful, other than the beach, <laughs> will be in the will be in this new building with new skills labs for the PA program, um, new um, OSCE labs. Um, so we're kind of excited about that. Thank you. So I'll introduce our next segment and hand it over to our president, Sarah. Uh, our next segment is titled admissions requirements slash qualifications. Thank you, Min. Um, so our first question is, can all prerequisite classes be taken at a community college? Yes, um, I don't recommend it unless you simply can't find, if you can't get the, the prerequisites at a four-year school. And the reason I say that is particularly for the sciences, <coughs> which are most of the prerequisites, we strongly recommend that you take the science course for a science major. <coughs> Excuse me, some of our um, community colleges can do that, have articulations within their science courses that will qualify as uh, courses for science majors at the four-year university, but that's not true of all of them. Um, we want you to take the most rigorous science courses you can so that you, when you get to us and you're taking graduate level courses, you're prepared for them. That said, we recognize that if you are not a degree-seeking student at the time, getting an upper division in biochemistry is extraordinarily difficult. So if you were here in San Diego, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and needed that biochemistry course, you couldn't get it at SDSU. They're just oversubscribed and you're not a degree seeking student and you wouldn't be able to get the course. So under those circumstances, we've said, get biochemistry where you can get it. We want you to take the most in-depth course you can but we recognize that biochemistry in particular, you're probably not gonna be able to get um, uh, if you're not, if you can't take it at your four-year university, you're probably not gonna be able to get it. Does that answer your question, Sarah? Yes, yes it does. Um, so I'll go ahead with the next question. So we're wondering about the total tuition costs for the program, for joining the program. Right. Um, for it's a seven semester program, um, tuition and fees for the whole thing um, is $117,000. It still makes my throat catch a little bit to say that, but. Okay, great. Um, so our next question is, what are you looking for in applicants? Um, how can applicants stand out to your program? Do you want to answer that, Dana? Or do you yeah, to... let me start, but then I'm going to hand, okay. hand it off to you. So um, let me help you 
take a step back. I know you want to know about PLNU, but I've been doing this a long time. And what I want to say to you is, um, is a little more global. I can tell you what we what's important to us, but some of you may listen to this and go, PLNU is not for me, and you're going to apply somewhere else. And so I want to start by helping you think in general about your application to a PA program wherever you choose to go. Um, the most important thing I can tell you is look carefully at the information surrounding the PA program that you're interested in so that you know what they value. Because there are many programs, of not inappropriately, value most highly your GPA. There are some programs, and they actually tend to be more on the West Coast, that really value the healthcare experience that you've had before you come. That doesn't mean GPA doesn't count, it does. Um, but they really want people with lots of healthcare experience with as much responsibility as, as possible. PLNU, we care about those things, obviously. We have GPA minimums, we have healthcare experience minimums, but the thing that doesn't, I don't think people realize when they look at us is we really wanna know based on your, uh, what you've done over the past X number of years that you have a commitment to service that you have a commitment to your community and that you have expressed that in an ongoing fashion, whether it's through your church, through a sorority, through a fraternity, we don't care where it is, whether you walk dogs because you love dogs, but that you have, that you have a commitment to something other than just your studies, other than just um, uh, pre prepping yourself for transfer to, that next, to the next level. Does that make sense to you? Look at the culture of where you want to go. Look at the culture of that school and make sure that 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 you your life is going to be in sync with the things that that program values because that's how you get ready for them. Great. Um, so you mentioned like patient care. Um, are there certain types of patient care experience that you prefer over others? It's not so much that we prefer, we recognize that I'm assuming y'all are somewhere in your undergraduate curriculum, right? Some, is it men who's a fourth year? Somebody who was a fourth year, anyway. Um, but we understand that while you're, while you're um, working your behind off to get good grades, that there, aren't, there may not be a lot of options for you to get healthcare experience. We recognize that. Um, and so if you're an MA or a nursing assistant or an EMT or a phlebotomist, all of those things are valuable. I will tell you from my perspective, the most important reason to have that experience isn't because you're going to bring a lot of skills with you into the PA program. You're not. It's just, you know, it's just way too different levels. But what you will have figured out is if you like it, when patients aren't happy with you, when they don't like being hurt, they're grumpy, they're sick, and they really don't want to be wherever you are. Um, and darn it, sometimes they're just out and out ungrateful for the care you're trying to give them. And if you still like coming to work in the morning, then you belong in medicine. But if you don't, if getting bled on and I'll just list all the things that have happened to me, bled on, vomited on, um, urinated on, defecated on, et cetera, et cetera, if those things don't make you go, oh, no, mm, it's none of us love it, don't misunderstand me. But if you can tolerate it and you still want to go to work the next day, um, then you belong in medicine. For me, that's what healthcare, that healthcare experience is bringing. Not a whole lot of skills that you're going to be able to transfer into your PA education. So get as much of it as you can. Try different things. You know, if you have the opportunity to be a nursing assistant um, this month and then the opportunity to be an EMT and increase your level of responsibility and healthcare experience happens, go for it. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your response to that. Um, so <laughs> our next question okay. is, um, does your program accept DACA students? That's an excellent question. And I, the answer is yes especially now that I feel a little better about it being continued and even um, 
uh, deepened a, a little more. Great. And then lastly, for the segment, um, one of the people that registered for this event um, were uh, they asked, um, do you accept medical scribe hours uh, for patient care or healthcare experience? I'm sorry, the question again? Um, do about you medical scribe. Medical scribe. Oh, medical scribe, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Okay, great. And then um, Min will go ahead and start us off with the next segment. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, before I get started on that, um, uh, Professor uh, Loria, is there anything you wanted to add to um, the previous segment? Um, oh, thank you for asking. No, I, I mean, I think um, pretty much everything was said. I, I would just contribute that, um, you know, looking at, at students and applicants that really want to give back to the community. And also something that's important for us would be um, PAs who want to come to PLNU, they want to learn and they want to get out in the field and actually stay in San Diego. Uh, that That is, is an important value um, for us as well. So that's, I think that's all I would really add to that. I think, I think Dr. Stanhope covered just about everything. Thank you. So our next segment is about clinical and didactic year. Um, can you uh, both give us some insight on the unique aspects of uh, both years uh, at PLNU. Okay. Do you want yeah. me to go ahead and talk about this yeah, one? Yeah, you, you take that one. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the, there's a little echo. Sorry if you can hear me. Um, so the didactic year, there's four semesters and um, our, our courses, um, our organ system courses are, are what we call symptom-based. Um, so uh, that would be clearly laid out as clinicians in training, just so that you're, you're able to become more efficient and, and better clinicians. Um, the didactic year, um, besides having organ system courses, we also have medicine and society, um, which is an amazing um, set of, of four courses, which is outside of the, of the organ system, talking about all sorts of different things that are involved in medicine and healthcare, you know, billing and, and public health and coding and interpersonal and interprofessional relationships, um, working with diverse populations, working with sensitive populations and really addressing the patient. So we're really excited about um, that series of, of courses on the didactic side. And again, I wish um, Professor Miller was here to, to go more into that for you. So over those four semesters, um, before the end of, of the didactic year, that service month comes into play uh, where students uh, would be going out into the community and working in food banks or with the homeless, um, giving back in some sort of way that's non-clinical. And that's tied to the third medicine and society uh, course as well. Um, we also, before the organ system courses, I should have started with, there are the, the basic sciences. So anatomy with the uh, cadaver dissection, physiology, um, a medical uh, science course, which would include immunology, genetics, biochemistry, and microbiology. And then of course, patient assessment, which is, uh, is a very important course for uh, physician assistants uh, to, um, to study. And then going into the clinical year, unfortunately, Dr. Vu, uh, or Dr. Vu and PA Vu are not here to talk about that, um, but they have uh, many, many connections throughout the community. Uh, they have strong connections with Sharp uh, Healthcare. Um, I'm not as, as versed on the clinical side, but there are many, many opportunities. Um, there's of course the core rotations and then the development of, of the um, electives as well. And so Professor Vu is working on those um, to secure more connections throughout the community. Um, Dr. Stanhope, do you wanna elaborate more on the clinical side? Um, and then if there's any, any more questions on the didactic side, I can, I can answer those. I did leave off learning communities, which I can circle back and include those. Um, I, I know that a common question, I'm sorry, my, this is Mike Gardner just took this opportunity to cut down on the Bougainvillea. So if, <laughs> if I need to move so you can hear me, just let me know. Um, one of the things that, um, that I, is a common question um, 
especially since all of you are in LA, is um, what about distant rotations? At this point in time, all of our rotations are scheduled to be in San Diego County. Now, San Diego County is big, um, but we, um, in, in fact, expect most of them to be in San Diego proper and its immediate environments. Not, we do not anticipate sending you out um, to anything other than we have a site in Brawley. Um, it's an excellent ER site, and that site is already um, provides uh, housing. So it, we wouldn't expect students to provide housing for themselves. In those rare instances where we, uh, who knows what will happen in the coming years with COVID, if we do send you outside of our like 50 mile radius, if we send you, we provide housing. If you decide, however, that you want to come do an elective back in LA or Orange County or wherever, um, then you provide the housing. But otherwise, we believe it's our responsibility. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this off. You all are going to be crazy. That's OK. I can talk about the learning community. Sorry, I, I had that issue this morning, too, with a meeting. The gardeners decided to have the air blowers. Um, the learning communities is, is an area that we're really excited about. As, uh, it's, part of the didactic uh, curriculum and the clinical curriculum. Um, and the learning communities are where students will be meeting with advisors. They'll have two faculty members who will be meeting on a weekly basis. We're going over cases, really bringing and enriching um, what you're learning in the classroom. Um, it's, it's great because the groups will be going throughout the program together. So we'll have small groups, five or six students with two faculty members as advisors and um, uh, presenting cases, bouncing ideas um, and learning as a group. And they'll remain together throughout the program, which is really great. Um, I, I, love, I love that aspect of, of our program as well. Any, any questions on those that can clarify? Um, Min, are you still there? Yes, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. Um, moving on to our next question. I know you guys touched a bit uh, on this topic, but can you talk a little more about um, the kinds of anatomy facilities that are offered? Uh, for example, cadavers or simulation labs? So um, right now, well, the, the anatomy uh, course, which is the, the only course that will actually be taught on the main campus because that's where our cadaver lab is, is housed. So the anatomy um, facility and course will of course be lecture lab with cadaver dissection. Um, so we will have cadavers to dissect. Um, the, as far as simulation labs, we, we will have simulation um, in, in other, labs, not not just with with anatomy. So we'll have mannequins and and uh, that students will be able to work on um, instead of regular patients as well as working on each other. So I, I hope that answers your question. But as far as a simulated um, anatomy lab, no, you the students will be working on on real cadavers. Thank you. So um, uh, is there anything you would Sorry for the echo. Anything you must suggest or urge uh, pre-PAs to do before starting their didactic year? For example, is there anything uh, we would need to brush up on to prepare us? I always tell um, as students, as we begin to accept students and they'll come back to me and say, what do I do to get, to get ready? I think the most important thing I can tell you is take a speed reading course. I know that sounds odd, but you are going to, in any PA program, be doing so much highly technical reading over and over, on and on, days in, days out, um, that the, your ability to read quickly but comprehensively is going to make a huge difference in you being actually able to carve out a little bit of time for fun. Um, and so I strongly recommend that you do that. And there are actually some good online systems that can increase your um, reading and comprehension. Um, I, I think no matter, <clears throat> pardon me, where you go or who you work with, that'll make a huge difference in, um, in 
ensuring that you um, master the material that the program will, will ask you to master. <clears throat> but other than that, as we sort of said, look at the things that the, that the program that you're applying to values and do the best you can to make yourself um, uh, competitive in those areas that they have already shown you are valuable to them. Thank you, Professor Lorna. Is there anything you would like to add to that? I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear you. Oh, I just was wondering if there's anything you would like to add to that. Um, no, I think we covered. Uh, Pretty much everything on that one. Um, I, you know what, what? One thing I would say before coming in, and this just goes back to um, the, the patient care and, and healthcare experience, is um, like Dr. Stanhope is saying, it's really important to know, you know, know the culture, know the, know the school that you're applying to, but also just with the patient care, I think it's really important. And I always advise students. Um, you know, the day in the life and, and those patient contact hours. It is really true that you want to know what you're getting into before you invest so much time um, and, and money, um, you know, financially um, into, the, into the PA profession. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful profession and it has a lot of lateral movement. Um, and it's, it's just a good idea to make sure it's, it's the profession and, it, and it's the right fit for you. Thank you. So one of the questions that our attendees ask is if Point Loma puts students in rotations or do students have to look for their own rotations? Can you give us a, a little more insight on the process of that? Yeah, that's really easy. Our accrediting body does not allow students to set up their own rotations. <clears throat> they don't allow you to seek them out. They don't allow you to arrange them. And if any program says that you have to do that, have to find your own rotations. That's a that's a big no-no. That's hugely not okay. Um, so the answer is we arrange them, we vet them, we speak with the preceptor, and we ensure that it's going to give you the best educational experience before we place any student in any setting. Now, having said that, if you know a pediatrician, an obstetrician, whatever, somebody who you think would be great with students, we are happy to take their name and their location and have a conversation with them. But ultimately, it's up to the program to determine that that's an appropriate site for you. Um, and I feel strongly after a number of years doing this that that's absolutely the right thing. I have seen too many students who went with um, physicians or practices that they had some relationship with, and it wasn't necessarily the best educational experience for them. And so we're happy to take recommendations from you, but it is our responsibility to vet and review that site and make sure that it's right for you before you're placed in it. Thank you. So the last question uh, on the segment is, Along with teaching what is needed to increase medical skills, will you guys have any regional, national, or abroad opportunities that will grant students to provide their service, uh, possibly to under uh, underserved communities? Daniel, you want to do that? One? Um, sure. Uh, sure. So, so there's an echo. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting a bunch of feedback. I'm sorry. Let me see if it's okay. All right. I think it's gone. Um, so with as, as far as um, I, I would just want to make sure I understand you're talking about with during the clinical years, correct? Yes. With with. Okay. So right now, um, like Dr. Stanhope said, all of the all of the um, clinical rotations or fellowships are or clerkships are in San Diego County, um, and then branching out um, just a little bit further. Um, as far as international opportunities, we don't have those at this time with the exception of some, um, crossing the border because of course we are right next to, to Mexico. Um, and so professor Miller has actually, um, done some outreach with some cross border, um, organizations and communities that students would be able to participate in. So there will be a wide range of opportunities, but as for 
you know, going and doing a study abroad with the program at this time, we don't have anything um, set up for students. Okay, great. Thank you all so much. Um, so that was all of our prepared questions. Um, if anyone else has any questions they'd like to have answered, they can go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, or you can just go ahead and unmute yourselves and ask the question. I have a question. So um, in terms of the didactic year and you know the dedication to the students learning and getting them to have the strong foundations and pass the didactic year, there are some schools that have a pass fail system or allow students to take their individual exam and then take it right after with the group. Um, what are your plans for testing and grading in your program? Okay, um, so the, the grading system would not be pass fail, it would be on, uh, you know, the ABC, your typical grading system. Um, so I, I think what you might be leading into is uh, remediation. Um, so if a, if a student wasn't successful, so remediation would be about learning that skill and making sure that you're acquiring that skill, but it wouldn't be about remediating the grade. Um, so if it was an exam, the grade would stand as is. Um, and the student would move forward as long as they remediate that skill or that lesson. Um, does that, it was Andy, right? Uh, did that answer your question about that? Yes, that does answer my question. And um, okay. so in term, if we do get grades at your program, um, what, so you're saying if we remediate, we, we can, so we still keep the same grade, but we remediate. So is there a minimum grade point average that you expect students to maintain? Absolutely. So with the remediation process, um, I mean, of course, you have to have passing grades to, to pass a course. Um, but if you are not acquiring a skill or if there's an exam, um, those would be able to be remediated. And we have a full process, which um, we probably don't have time for me to go into the whole process. But students are allowed to remediate a certain number of times um, during the didactic and the clinical years. So um, as long, uh, and then there would be different steps. If, if a student is not, uh, you know, if they're academically deficient, then there are, there are steps in, and um, that students would have to follow to actually be able to, to get through that course. But as, as far as individual skills and individual exams, um, students would keep that grade and then um, retake that exam or re, uh, we would reassess that skill. So there, there would, but, but in other words, for courses, yes, you would have to have the minimum uh, grade in order to pass and progress throughout the program. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we have a, a question in the chat box from, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, Mayalin. Um, so are there resources for mental health for students or resources for students struggling? <laughs> So there's two, yes, the answer is yes. Um, there are, um, along with the um, physician assistant program, um, we are uh, five minutes from our Master of Arts in Clinical Counseling program. And the graduate students there offer free uh, clinic, I suppose you'd call it, for, um, for any graduate student at PLNU. Um, and they work in concert with their um, supervising psychologist. Um, so part of what we're thinking about doing is, um, is matching, if you will, um, our students with one of those um, clinical counseling students. Um, not, I mean, if you develop an ongoing relationship and friendship, fine. But even if you just know that that resource is there, it's there for you. And actually the plans, the long-term plans are that the MACC program will move into the same building we're in. So they'll be literally around the corner. Um, they have to finish out their lease where they are. Uh, ultimately though, um, every student is required to have health, uh, health insurance. And the, if you need greater support than the MACC program can provide, then we have a referrals, we use that referral system for your health insurance to place you with someone with greater um, um, opportunity to work more closely with the student who needs help. 
Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, really interesting. That. That that's great. That's great. Um, if um, anyone else has any questions, then go ahead and go ahead and talk it. I, you know, I didn't really answer my lens question about academics struggling. I answered the mental health question, but not so much academics. Um, we have an organization on the campus called Student Success, and they do offer um, academic resources and tutoring. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure that they're necessarily going to be able to offer the kind of tutoring that PA students will need, um, since medicine isn't their background. Um, but we have a one, we have an amazing um, group of community PAs who are very invested in working with the program. And so part of what we are doing is collecting them, collecting their area of interest and collecting their area of expertise so that we can match you with someone who understands what you're going through and can um, uh, provide some academic support for you um, as you need it. Now that doesn't alleviate the faculty of our responsibilities to work with you. And obviously um, I have an open door uh, policy. I think almost everybody else does as well. And when you need help, we hope you'll come um, find us and tell us what you need. And if we can't do it specifically, we'll find someone who can. Awesome. Um, so our I'm next, so our our next uh, sorry, do you guys feel like an echo of my voice? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I think we all have an echo. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, so there's a question saying, I was curious how long the program was running and if it is fully accredited. Um, the answer is no, it is not fully accredited. We have applied for what's called provisional accreditation. We'll hear about that uh, finally in uh, March. Um, we had a site visit a month ago. Holy cow, Danielle, it was a month ago. Um, and it went very well. We have every reason to suppose that in March when the commission reviews us, we'll be accredited. Um, provisional accreditation is fully accredited. It always sounds kind of funky, like somehow it isn't, but it is. And so, once you enter a program that is provisionally accredited, you're, you are then a graduate of an accredited program and can sit for the national certifying exam. And that's the um, gateway to license in every state in the country. So you don't have to do whether you come to PLNU or elsewhere. If the program is provisionally accredited, you don't have to worry about it being, it is accredited. changes will cover that. Um, Min, do you want to go ahead and ask the question in the chat? Yes. Uh, what changes will COVID have on the program in respect to the application process and once PA students start? Well, it, it definitely had a, a, an impact on our application process as far as interviewing. So, oh, oh yeah, there's the echo. Uh, so we are doing all of our interviews. Oh gosh, gosh, all of our interviews are done virtually right now. So we are um, zooming with all of the applicants and um, having individual and group meetings. Um, that COVID definitely had an impact on that. Um, we're lucky in the fact that 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 the students don't start until fall of twenty one. So hopefully. You know, we're hoping that COVID will um, be under control at that point. But um, the way the first semester is designed, having having courses online would not be an issue. Um, the only um, thing that we'd really have to work with would be the cadaver labs and doing the dissections and working around in small groups that are socially distanced um, in order to complete their their um, cadaver dissections. But the other courses are are you know pretty common. Um, lecture-based courses that would be um, uh, easily provided for online. Moving forward from that, we, we have a very, um, uh, I would say supportive, uh, what's, what, what's their, their division? I just blanked on it. Um, as far as Canvas and our, our learning, uh, what am I thinking? What, 
instructional technology. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so our instructional technology, instructional technology is very supportive. Very supportive. They have they a have lot of ideas, lot of ideas uh, and, and also right also now a lot of the other courses and jobs and, 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 and the other programs the other are functioning program. online, so we're learning from them as well. Great, and then um, Andy had another question. Uh, will there be any supplies provided to students by the program, such as otoscopes or stethoscopes and any learning devices such as iPads for note taking? That's a great question, Andy. Um, the answer is we are, we, the program, are purchasing access medicine. So with few exceptions, you will not have to buy books. They'll be provided to you electronically. Um, we are also not requiring students to buy diagnostic kits, which is otoscopes, ophthalmoscopes. The only equipment you'll have to buy is um, a stethoscope. I recommend Littman cardiology. But that's a different discussion. Um, and a um, reflex hammer and a tuning fork. Um, everything else will be provided for you. Learning devices, no. Um, the, we've talked with the university about that because they they really love iPads. Um, but at this point, we don't have any particular plans to provide um, electronic devices to you. All right, um, thank you so much. I think that might be all for our questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Stanthrope and uh, Professor Loria for joining us today. And um, we wish you the best and have a great day. Thank you so thank much. You for thank having you us. for having us. Yeah. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much. All right.